Wow, three amazing talks. Um, I'd like to open up the floor now for your questions. Uh, do we have a first brave person with a question in the front row? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Rose. I work for Transparency International UK. My question is for Eshban. Um, in Parliament Watch's campaign to share what Parliament were talking about on Twitter, did you get any pushback from Parliament um, to, to sort of downplay anything that made them not look good? Or did you sense that maybe they weren't having conversations that they would have had if you weren't in the room? And how did you respond to that? Thank you. Yes, um, so there's been a lot of pushback from Parliament. And um, how, we, how do we respond to it? Well, essentially, like I said, Parliament is a very difficult um, institution to access. So a lot of our work is really dependent on how much access they give us. Um, so what we've done, or what we've been very specific to do is to cultivate relationships um, with the speaker as well as the mainstream press. So for the few times when we haven't been able to, uh, when we haven't been able to, 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 to tweet or to publish or to have our work on Facebook, um, what we do is, uh, or, or what has happened is that a lot of people in the online, uh, in the online community have come in to say, guys, we're not getting this information from you. We had something that we called Accountability Friday where every Friday we would put up information from the Auditor General's report. And the day we missed, Accountability Friday. Luckily for us, the online community or the Twitter community in Uganda came out and said, oh, Parliament Watch, what's happening? Where's Accountability Friday? So, you know, we use some subtle things like that to, you know, quote unquote, like blackmail Parliament and say, you know, you, we are needed so, so that um, when they're not happy with us, the backlash, is, uh, the, black, the backlash is not too bad. But they also know in many ways that, like, like I said, our work is to, publish information, whether, it's, whether it makes them look good or bad. And sometimes they have some good content out there, so they also know that you know, there's, a, there's, there's a benefit in maintaining a relationship with us. We had a... Hi, thanks all three for your presentations. Really interesting material. Um, my name is Catherine. I work at Open Contracting Partnership. We're the organization that maintains the Open Contracting Data Standard. So Jamila actually had a question for you. So in designing the standard and later the technical advice that we give about how to implement the standard, we keep use cases at the forefront. So we want to make sure that whatever data is published is ultimately used and that really means that we need to focus on um, who's using the data, how they're using it, what formats it needs to be in. And one of the biggest challenges that we face is that governments are very on board with the idea of uh, transparency and, and anti-corruption and all these really big nebulous terms, but it's really hard to create spaces where we can have government talk to civil society and talking to private sector to identify the really specific use cases um, and how concretely to use these data. So I was wondering if in your experiences you could give any advice on how to create those spaces and make sure there are safe spaces so that everyone's voice is heard. Thank you. Um, I. Um I mean, you're the experts on open contracting, so I won't get too <laughs> too much into the specifics on that. But um, we have found that on a lot of the issues that we're tracking, um, this uh, we're tracking through my project. We uh, we kind of have a, we're a good bridge between government and other civil society groups. Um, we have a, a pretty good. Um, I would like to say reputation as being fairly government friendly, although critical we want to, but you know, a good a good thing between the two of them. Um, specifically on open contracting and the data that you how you want the data to be. Um, in TI UK, we don't, I don't know, I don't think that we have anybody that's looking at it specifically, although we have tracked that it's started to be implemented, although we recognize it's not at the highest, the most advanced rung yet, I think is the way it is. Um, but in terms of advice on how to bring people together, it's just trying to get government to do that themselves. At the moment, the UK government is very willing to do that, but it's just pushing them to do it themselves without us asking them to, I think is what we'd say. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, my name is John Buckley. I'm an Irish uh, experience designer. Uh, my question's for Eshban. Um, and essentially, I'm just curious uh, about the citizens who engaged on, on Twitter. Do you know who they are? Were they politically engaged before? Or do you think you opened up parliament and, and government and democracy and, and engagement to new people? Um, 
so so far the data that we've been oh should do, do I? Okay, sorry, okay sure okay. all right so so far the data that we've been able to collect on the on the audiences that or on the followers that we have that we have on twitter is only segmented in as far as age what kind of devices they use and, and gender as well um so yeah i have to say that right now we we have no way of of, of, of knowing whether these were individuals that were politically engaged before. But I'll say that 35% um, of the users are women, and I think that maybe says something about Uganda's society or Uganda's online community, and that, and that most of them use smartphones as opposed to, 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 to laptops, which also tells us what kind of, you know, what kind of social class they belong to, whether they are, what kind of social class they belong to, and we will place them somewhere between 15 to 37. Uh, hello, thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Tom Miller. I'm from the European Commission, and I'd just like to say my mission expenses forms of open for uh, analysis later on. Um, I had a couple of quick questions for, for Jamila. First of all, you talked about the Global Pledge Tracker, and I wondered if there, is there much pushback or feedback from that from governments? You talked about government departments in the UK giving you feedback. Have you, ever, have you had feedback from particularly international uh, actors? And uh, second of all, for Eshban, um, you talked about the feedback uh, from Parliament and the pushback, if you like, and how you... you made sure that you were essential to that dialogue. What about from the presidency there? I mean, particularly when you're talking about the budget, I, you know, the presidency budget um, in Uganda is, is disproportionate, shall we say. Did you have the executive giving you pushback in Uganda? Because I imagine a lot of the countries we work in, that's where the real issue is. I'll go first. Um, so um, the global one was really interesting. So it followed the same methodology. So we still base we have asked our chapters in those, office, in those countries to still base their assessments on what's public. And they did that. They researched, they found either there was information or there wasn't, and that's what they used to make their assessments. And a couple of governments, when we published it, pushed back and were quite upset that we had said they hadn't acted when they said they had. And then so I think that hopefully in future iterations it will, promote, it will encourage them to be proactive with publishing, just as, as Louise was saying. Um, I think um, in general... Uh, the way that the tool is, there's a tendency to think that there's a comparison that can be made between countries. So you can say Spain's doing so well and it's doing way better than X country, but it, because of the nature of the commitments, you can't actually say that. And I, often it's the governments themselves that like to pitch themselves against each other in that sense. And you can say, yes, you might have completed more, but none of them were new and none of them were ambitious and it was all that the, the bar was so low. Um, so the, the discourse around it has been interesting. I don't think there's been um, that much resistance to it, but I, I know that um, there's a, an example from Kenya, for example, our office there, when they started to research the, the work that was being done, they went to their different government departments in Kenya and none of their departments even knew these commitments had been made in the first place. So again, it's the story of if we hadn't been looking, would anything have been done? And so now that things are starting to be pushed a certain direction, even if certain departments are a little bit resistant or unsure what to do next, at least it's starting the conversation. Do we have okay. other questions? Okay, Sorry. thank you very much. Um, my name is Sefia Bichi. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah, so um, pushback from the presidency. Um, well, there's been some pushback, but uh, the Ugandan president is very subtle. Uh, he's, 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 not, uh, he's confrontational, but also a very subtle person. Um, so we did a study on the presidential pledges, and it showed that there were close to 300 unfulfilled presidential pledges, and almost half of those were you know, promises that he made in specific districts where he would go and promise um, electricity or a road, etc. and we published that. Uh, but to say that there's been any direct pushback from the presidency, no, the, uh, no, at least there hasn't, and we haven't felt it. Most of the um, resistance that we get is through um, institutions uh, such as parliament or other government institutions, which would, which would be, you know, the method or the hand that he would use. Um, yeah. Can I go ahead? Go ahead. Okay. My name is Sefia Bichi from Yaga Africa, based in Nigeria. My question is to Parliament Watch, and thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, you, I was very interested when you talk about the analysis you did on representation of women, and looking at how 
uh, probably it reflects to the issues discussed around gender or women in the parliament. Did you also consider doing such analysis for the marginalized group like youth and also people with disability to also see how uh, maybe it's a reflection of how the parliament refers to issues that concerns them. Then on the other side, uh, I love the analysis you did around um, around the, H the qualification of the parliament, Tyrians. So uh, I don't know if you went ahead to do a comparison with their performance, probably using the Uganda scorecard to see whether this reflects uh, the performance or this is against the, 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 the rationale or the common knowledge that the each qualification or the benchmark in terms of their qualification is what reflects to poor uh, parliamentary activities. All right. Um, so on the persons with disabilities, yes, we did that, but uh, I, I didn't have the time to show it. Um, so we have five um, disabled members of parliament in Uganda. And in many ways, that's also reflected in the way legislation is passed. We have a persons with disabilities bill that has been in parliament for the last four and a half years now. And um, so they brought it the first time, then they took it back because of reasons about it not being clear. But you're absolutely right. I think because Parliament or, uh, is really a game of numbers, so the, you know, the more numbers that you have, the more likely you, you're going to have your issues uh, prioritized. On, on education and, and the scorecard, well, when we produced that list of qualifications for members of Parliament, we ha it, it compelled us to think, uh, does having a PhD make you less sexist? Does having a master's degree make you, make you less homophobic? And uh, I mean, clearly it doesn't. But also, um, some of the challenges, some of the challenges that we have, is how to reconcile what we know as the roles of parliament and what the society expects members of parliament to do. Because when we go into the communities, uh, we find that a lot of people have a very distorted understanding of what members of parliament do. In Uganda, when they send you to parliament, they're not sending you to legislate on death penalty or minimum wage or whatever proposed law. They are essentially sending you to go get a piece of the national cake, and however you get it, and bring back to split with them. So you have MPs who will not say a single word in parliament. These are the most silent people. But when they go back to their constituencies, they'll distribute patronage, use personal resources, uh, use res their personal resources to extend personal generosity. So um, in parliament, they're doing really badly, but in the communities, they're rock stars. So, uh, so when we are putting together a scorecard, those are the two things that we must reconcile. Uh, do we go ahead and rate them based on what we think is right, or do we completely disregard societal's understanding and expectations of what their leaders uh, should present to them? So the scorecard is something that we've been thinking about a lot. We are still thinking about because uh, in an ideal world, we'd like to reconcile those two things. Hi, thank you for all your presentations. It's inspiring and we, you know, it's always good to have successes presented. Um, I'm from France and what we've seen is that it's very difficult for civic tech um, developers in France to go against the government because usually they depend on the funding from public institutions. So my first question was to the three of you, how are you funded and how do you manage to not, you know, have a conflict of, you know, like we might not get funding from the government if we publish something. And then I had more specific questions on how you build community, because for instance, um, Luisa, you, men you mentioned that all these people um, engaged in the campaign for a short amount of time, and I was wondering if they got the response as well, when you know, the commission sent back the forms, did they get them as well? Did they, were they involved in you know, other activities? Um, and Jamila, I was wondering if maybe you had thought of something similar to focus on companies in addition to institutions? <laughs> it's a difficult question, I'm sorry. Um, and finally, Eshban, there's, a, there's a, an initiative in France that's called Acropolis, where what they do is they comment in live what is happening, but by video. So you have the video of what is happening in the, well, in the parliament, and then there's someone explaining and going back on the issues and sort of making jokes and, well, anyway. And I was wondering if you had some initiatives like this to also keep building the community um, over a longer term. Um, so first, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, first, in terms of funding, uh, for us, I guess it 
was easy in that sense because we have, depending on the time period, at Texas Info from very little to zero public funding. Um, so our main uh, funders currently are the Open Society Foundations and a private foundation which is called Adesium that funds um, work related to democracy, uh, participation, transparency, accountability, etc. So in that sense, um, we, it's true that it's easier in terms of feel um, independence to do this kind of campaigns uh, targeting very directly public institutions. And in terms of creating community, um, it was certainly a very, very big part uh, of the campaign. Also, um, first to get the campaign running and to manage to file as much requests as possible in the shortest amount of time, but also to uh, keep the campaign going after uh, we had this setback from the commission. Um, so. To prepare, um, we reached out to many, many organizations with whom we usually work with. Uh, so it was uh, freedom of information organizations, um, organizations that work on transparency, on participation. I mean, every contact we had uh, with whom we worked earlier and also um, some members of the um, academic circles working on transparency. Um, people from media outlets we usually work with. I mean, we told basically everyone um, that this was happening and uh, we gave them this kind of alert to just spread out the word, um, take part in the campaign, so there was a lot of preparation. And afterwards, um, we had uh, a list with all the people that had participated in the campaign and we communicated with them um, consistently throughout the different developments of the campaign. So for example, when there was this refusal and we had to go to the ombudsman, um, we told the requesters, well, this is what's happening, this is what we plan to do, that's how we managed to get the signatures uh, for the European Commission complaint. Um, when we had the first release, we also were in contact with them. Um, and actually, we managed to work with the, with the investigative journalist at NAC because he was one of the persons that had participated in the campaign. And when we informed um, the requesters that this two-month disclosure had happened, he got in touch immediately and he said, well, this is very interesting. And we said, well, we're glad we find it, you find it interesting. Why don't we work together? So it's this constant... Uh, communications with them um, that managed to keep also the campaign together throughout the whole process. Um, no, we don't get any funding from the public sector. Um, one specifically, uh, I should tell you that one of the things, uh, if you wanted to, if you wanted to read a committee report of a meeting that happened in Parliament, the only place you'd get it would be the Parliament Watch website, but government and parliament has funding to do these very things but i don't know for some reason they just don't uh, so the way it is structured right now because some of the work that we do is essentially work that they should or would be doing so they uh, they keep all the money for themselves um on um, on video i think video is the language of the of the future and literally i, th I increasingly we are debating whether we, we whether we whether we are still interested in doing uh, policy analysis, we occasionally publish about four-page about four-page uh, policy briefs and analysis on issues that are happening in Parliament. But more and more, we find that nobody is reading it. We put it up on the website, and it doesn't get any hits. But you do a video on the same. I mean, you have ten thousand hits in. You in, 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 have 10,000 views in a couple of days. So I, I, I agree with you absolutely that I think video is something that we ought to be doing um, a little bit more. The, the challenge is that sometimes, I guess the way the development world is, is organized is that um, sometimes you need consensus. Or the people that support you, you also need the guys in the team to buy into it for everybody to know, okay, you know, this is where we are going um, wholeheartedly. Yep. Um, so um, the first, the very first 
Tracker, which was the UK Pledge Tracker, was um, initially funded by the Amidyar Network, who I hope don't mind me saying that because I think they're in the room. Um, and that was the first year of the project. Um, and since then, we have received funding to extend the idea to other countries from the UK government. So we're most our entire summit follow-up project until 2020 is funded by the UK government. Um, and we wrapped the UK stuff into that, but it is mostly overseas the way that we do that work. Um, on whether we would do the same thing or are doing the same thing with the businesses, uh, uh, I don't think I have the expertise to do that. But um, my colleagues back in London, we have a business integrity program who um, do a lot of work looking at the, the efforts that business do to uphold their integrity and see if they are sticking to the standards that they set themselves. Um, and uh, the work they do is actually a lot more robust than this. I should also say that in the global pledge tracker, um, we include um, information done by those five international organizations that were there. So the IMF, the OECD, the UN, World Bank, and uh, the Commonwealth Secretariat are also included in that. Um, so not businesses, but we're looking at multilaterals as well. I think we're now out of time for questions, but uh, I encourage you to continue the conversation over lunch. It just remains to ask you to join me again in thanking our three fantastic speakers. Thank you.